Welcome to a very special edition of the Demi Vlog. My name is Dr. David Dyser. I'm a naturopathic doctor in Vancouver, BC, and the medical director of both DemiHealth.com and the Finlandia Health Center. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like holistic health and wellness videos, this is the channel for you. Please subscribe. We'll do more like this one. Today is a very special episode. We're doing a calorie restricted uh, calorie restriction slideshow that I prepared uh, for a special group that I host called uh, Low Carb Vancouver. Um, I think that this lecture or this presentation is extremely important because it simply highlights some of the recent articles, uh, journal entries, um, and studies done in the last three to four years on calorie restriction, time restricted uh, feeding or eating, and intermittent fasting. Now, um, this is not an, an, an exhaustive review by any means. This is just a few uh, cherry-picked articles that I have uh, gathered over the last uh, six months or so and wanted to put into a slideshow just to share with all of you because as I'm reviewing um, journals and going through what people are studying and what people are doing to try to reduce chronic disease, I just want to share as much as I can. You know, my, my goal for my clinical practice is to help as many people as possible feel uh, their absolute best for as long as possible. So I'm focused on longevity and health span uh, with a significant uh, um, dedication to the reduction of chronic disease. So that's what I do, and I really do believe that low carb, um, or at least calorie restriction, is an important part of that process. You know, I, I think that we can cure obesity, for example using these type of tools and uh, so whenever I come across things I want to just do my best to share them. A little bit about me, I like I said I'm, I'm a naturopathic doctor, excuse me, uh, I, uh, I have been in practice for five years, I have uh, an evidence informed slash evidence in ba evidence based practice where I focus mostly on uh, diet therapy, lifestyle therapy, and uh, very basic prescribing. I have uh, prescription rights here in British Columbia, so I use very similar me similar medicines to most family doctors around, um, while at the same time trying my best to use the uh, the uh, evidence based herbal prescriptions we have available, um, in addition to orthomolecular therapy, including vitamins and minerals. So that's kind of uh, my practice. That's what I do, and I I'm glad you decided to join me today. And uh, I'm excited to go through some of this information. So if you're new to fasting, if you're new to calorie restriction, you'll find this really interesting. If you're experienced, you'll have a little more uh, data in your pocket to uh, share with your, your friends or clients if you're seeing people on a, on a patient slash client basis. I hope you really get something out of this that's useful for your either personal or professional life. So thanks for tuning in. So uh, let's move on here. I, uh, I, I think calorie restriction is important and uh, today I want to show you why. So uh, the first slide on the doc here is, uh, is uh, just, to, just to highlight sort of where we are now in terms of um, the, the absolute benefits of calorie restriction and fasting in general. You know, as a population, we seem to be getting sicker we seem to be getting larger. We have more access to food than we ever have. It's everywhere. You can literally consume carbs in the next 10 minutes if you really put your mind to it. And it's very easy for all of us, regardless of our income status, to overeat today, even if we have zero groceries. Um, you know, we're, le we're living in larger, uh, we're in denser areas with uh, more food availability, which has transformed, um, you know, our population for many positive, in many positive ways. But in one major negative way, it's made us a little bit more o overweight, a little bit more on the uh, uh, pushing the obesity side, and it's made us a little bit sicker overall. You know, hyperinsulinemia or the rise in insulin that we get from eating too many carbs has been associated with many chronic diseases. Obesity is associated with many chronic diseases, including 12 or 13 different types of cancers. It might even be 14 now. Um, obesity, of course, is uh, implicated, uh, is, a, is, a, is present in type 2 diabetes. It's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It's, it's just a risky thing to be involved in. Um, so overeating is a main driver of obesity. So that's, you know, one of my passions for caloric restriction and fasting in general is to try to reverse that. And it's definitely possible. So this little article here that I've highlighted is, is how can it kind of says, how can fasting help? How could it be implemented more regularly in our modern society to contribute positively to health outcomes? 
And will it be helpful for longevity? Will it be helpful for other things rather than just weight loss? Well, the answer is yes. Fasting or low calorie diets in general seem to be a physiologic trigger or, you know, not eating is a physiologic trigger uh, trigger for many optimal metabolic functions. It sets our immune system into a state of apoptosis, so it clears out old non-functioning cells. It helps with hormone balance. It improves uh, stress responses. It, of course, helps you lose weight. It, uh, you know, is good for mood in general. There are so many benefits to low-calorie diet and um, energy restriction that it's just unavoidable. Um, and this little article here kind of outlines it. Now, with all of these articles, you can kind of Google them, and then usually you can find an open source access to it. So if you like uh, the sound of it, just Google the title, and I'm sure you'll find it. Now, before we jump into the, the, the nuts and bolts of today's lecture, it's important to re review kind of my definition of the types of fasting or caloric restriction. Number one, calorie restriction in general is usually just eating the same foods you normally eat in the same pattern you eat, but reducing the amount of calories you consume on a day-to-day -day basis. So still eating at the same time as you normally eat, in the same way you normally eat, just eating less. That's calorie restriction. Uh, Time-restricted feeding is only eating within a certain window of opportunity. So for example, only eating for eight hours a day and then, and then fasting for 16 or only eating for um, 10 hours a day and then fasting for 14. Those are types of time-restricted feeding. And then intermittent fasting is uh, doing a fasting protocol on an intermittent basis. So for example, taking uh, uh, one day a week and having only water uh, or having three days a month only water. Uh, some people would also say that uh, having a calorie restriction for two days a week or the 5-2 diet would be a type of intermittent fasting. But really when it's used properly, it's that uh, total fasting, so just water-only diet for a certain number of days. That would be what intermittent fasting would be called. So those those uh, definitions could be considered important as we move forward. So that's the first one, just a general outline. The findings that they are reviewing is that calorie restriction triggers a complex series of intricate events, including activation of cellular stress response elements, improved autophagy or clearing out of, uh, of old, uh, old dead cells, modification of apoptosis, so getting rid of um, altered or genetically uh, damaged cells, and alteration hormone balance. So we're talking in hormone balance, we're talking about um, not only uh, male and female hormones, but we're talking about things like thyroid hormone and um, insulin and uh, leptin and ghrelin, your hunger hormones. Intermittent fasting not only more acceptable to patients, but also prevents some, prevents some of the adverse effects of chronic calorie restriction, especially malnutrition. And we'll get into this as we move forward. Intermittent fasting is a lot easier than, than calorie restriction uh, for most people and has some more, some more a bit of an extra benefit in many cases. Uh, what else? Uh, some behavioral modifications related to abstinence of binge eating following a fasting period are crucial in maintaining the desired favorable outcome. So don't overeat when you're done. When you're breaking a fast, you can't just overdo it. That just kind of gets rid of all the benefit you got from the fast. But um, that's, that's, not, uh, that's just something to watch out for. Okay, so the next slide here. The effects of intermittent or continuous energy restriction on weight loss and metabolic disease risk markers. This was a randomized trial in young overweight women. This trial is really interesting. This is published in Nature's uh, International Journal of Obesity. And uh, it, it just reviews the benefits on weight loss for calorie restriction and intermittent fasting. In this study, they took 107 women and they just said, okay, let's see what happens. We can do some intermittent fasting and we can do some calorie restriction and we can do uh, a six month study here and we'll see which one is better. So there, the two diets they tried were very simple. One was two days per week. They had the group only eat 600 calories. And the rest of the week, the other five days, they could eat whatever they want. That was one group. The other group was just a calorie restriction, where they ate 1,400 calories a day for all, uh, every day for seven days a week. And they did this for six months. 
So you can see one was intermittent fasting or a sort of type of intermittent uh, energy restriction where they had the 5-2 diet and the other one was just only eat 1400 calories a day every day. And these women started out with a BMI of 30 which means their average, their average body mass index was in the obese category. And some very interesting things happened. The intermittent energy restriction group over six months lost 14 pounds on average. And um, the continuous energy restriction group, they lost 10 or 12 pounds on average over six months. So the intermittent group lost a little bit more. Um, and, but both groups lost weight, like it was effective for, uh, for on average for people over six months and um, you know it wasn't terribly difficult. Some other benefits they experienced, both groups experienced comparable reductions in CRP, C-reactive protein, a marker of inflammation. They both had reductions in LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, blood pressure. They both had increases in sex hormone binding globulin, uh, uh, insulin-like gro growth factor binding proteins one and two, so binding the inflammatory molecule insulin-like growth factor, which would reduce its availability. They both had reductions in fasting insulin. Their insulin resistance scores were improved. Um, on both of those things, on the insulin side, it seemed like the intermittent energy restriction group was better for insulin changes, just slightly, but they both did well. Um, what was quite important about this, which I would like to leave you with, okay, so both of these diets work for weight loss, so cutting your calories works um, on average for people, not for everybody, that's why the holistic approach is important, but on average it works. The, the, the key here is that the group that was uh, eating the low calorie diet every day, 1400 calories a day every day, they lost a little less weight, but they still lost weight but they were hungrier. It was a bit more stressful for them because they just had, they had hunger every day um, on average. And um, that's a problem because, you know, this was a, an energy restriction trial, so they were only allowed to eat 1400 calories a day. But in regular life, you're gonna overeat if you're hungry. You're gonna rebound eat. Um, we all do, it's common, it's natural when you're hungry to eat. And um, the people who were eating less calories, they were hungrier. The people who were doing the intermittent energy restriction or just the two days where they were just you know, only allowed to eat 600 calories, they could push through. The rest of the week, they were not hungrier. So that's really important. Plus that group had better insulin resistance improvements. So I really like intermittent energy restriction for people. Um, for most people who experience significant hunger, this is a really, really good option. So that was a fascinating study and you know, uh, published in an awesome journal, had over 100 people, I love it. The next one on the list here, calorie restriction in combination with prebiotic supplementation in obese women with depression. Okay, so the first study showed, all right, so it works in weight loss. Now, what about calorie restriction for mood? Okay, so I think this is important. This study was looking at um, adding in a prebiotic, which is, in this case, they use ins inulin or a, a fiber that helps your probiotics multiply. But that wasn't really why I input this here. The, the reason I wanted to input this was to mention the effects of fasting or the effects of calorie restriction on mood. And uh, let's go through the basics of this. Um, so what other benefit can we get from calorie restriction? Well, you know, in general, not much on this planet works for major depressive disorder. I'm not talking about mild and moderate depression. We have lots of things that are effective for mild and moderate depression. You know, St. John's Ward, magnesium, a bunch of different things are effective, exercise. But not much works for major depressive disorder. That's when medications are very, very important. Now, this study noted that major depressive disorder associated with obesity, so people who are on the overweight or obese side have a, have a higher risk of having major depressive disorder. So they want to see, okay, what about calorie restriction? Does it work for improving mood? And if you add a prebiotic, does it work even more? And what did they use here? They used a, a, um, uh, a two different uh, analysis techniques. They used the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, and they used a, the Beck Depression Inventory um, scale for pre and post intervention assessments. They also looked at fasting levels of glucose, insulin, they looked at cholesterol, they looked at a few different things. 
Um, they used the HOMA IR score for insulin resistance. I really like doing that calculation. They had 45 people who were able to complete the study. And what they did here was they did a 25% reduction in calories uh, for eight weeks. So it was a short study. And um, what they noted from this, from this study that was that in general, the, most, the, the more weight you lost, the better the depressive, depressive symptoms were reduced. So the, the, the mood scores were directly correlated to weight loss. Love seeing that. When you lose weight, your mood improves. Even in major depressive disorder, a, a significant psychiatric disorder, we're talking about major depression here. So they saw a major uh, reduction in the um, Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, which is, which is excellent. Um, the, the, it's important to note that the, the, the prebiotic uh, that was added to one of the groups had some beneficial metabolic effects um, in terms of uh, what was improved here. Um, the, in terms of fat mass and uh, cholesterol. So in t total fat mass and total cholesterol were reduced more in the prebiotic arm. So that was interesting. Prebiotics uh, helped these people. It's a small study, but it seemed like it was beneficial for that group. Um, so if you're trying to reduce cholesterol, it seems like uh, prebiotics or getting enough fiber is really important, which we, you know, we know well, it's a, dietarily one of the main things we have really for reducing cholesterol is fiber. So that actually this is another trial that just shows that. But um, fat mass was reduced as well, a little more in the prebiotic arm. And um, that, that's really interesting to me. I, I, I like to see that. But overall, the people who lost the most amount of weight had the best mood response. Love it, love it, love it. Calorie restriction works for mood. Done. Next up on the list, they're looking at the Dawood fasting protocol. It's basically a fasting every other day protocol. It's a, it's a spiritual practice or religious practice that's done. Um, this study was, was interesting. They just took uh, one round of this, 22 days, fasting every other day. So water fast every second day for 22 days. They used 48 people. This study I've added because it's looking not only at, not, not at depression, but at anxiety. And um, I, 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 I want to move forward with simply highlighting all the other benefits you can get from calorie restriction and fasting in general. And this one kind of takes us down this path. This was published in 2018, the Journal of Complementary and Integrative Medicine. Um, they, were, they, they used a scale called the Hamilton Rating Scale for anxiety to assess anxiety in people over this 22 days. And what they found was the group that did the 22 days of alternate day fasting had a 5% reduction in anxiety and that was considered statistically significant over the course of 22 days. Holy smokes. That's amazing to see. You know, I, it looks subtle, like it's only 4.37%. Okay, that's fair. But we're talking about one round. We're talking about only 11 days of, of this type of fasting. If, we, if they did more, would the, the uh, alternate day fasting effect on anxiety be more pronounced? I'd like to see that study done. And that would be something to, uh, to, for them to look at in the future. Results showed that 22 days of Dawood fast reduced respondents' complaints about anxiety by 4.37% and was significantly different from the non-fasting group. So that's important. The clinical significance was reached. So that's to say that this could be used in a clinical setting, like in my practice here, as a therapy in anxiety because it reached clinical significance. And when we add that to other things that would be part of the holistic approach, we might even see a more pronounced benefit. So I love seeing that. Next up on the list, how does calorie restriction and fasting affect brain function? So we've talked about weight loss, mood, anxiety. What about performance? What about cognition and cognitive enhancement? Well, this was, um, th this was a, a simple review uh, published in the Journal of Exercise Rehabilitation 2019, just recently, June 30th, just came across it. And they were looking at beta-hydroxybutyrate or ketone bodies. When they go up, what, what effect can they have on the brain? You probably know that a lot of people are going keto now, and there uh, is some clinical benefit for that in, in different circumstances. And I do use it clinically in things like dementia, uh, type uh, initial onset type two diabetes, uh, not when they're not when people are not prescribed insulin. I use it in uh, juvenile epilepsy and now more broadly in, in different type of, types of epilepsy. 
But what about cognitive enhancement or cognitive performance for people? So I have a lot of people coming in with subjective, subjective cognitive impairment or uh, SCI and mild cognitive impairment, MCI. And they wonder about going into ketosis or going into a very, very low carb lifestyle. What effect did it have on the brain? Well, this study looked at how does uh, beta hydroxybutyrate or ketones affect us physiologically? Well, geez, or this was a review that looked at it. Oh my goodness, it does upregulate BDNF. BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, is is a is a uh, a molecule that goes up uh, to help us uh, w with cognition. So it has multiple uh, mechanisms in the brain to improve cognition. It is something that is increased acutely in exercise, as people feel sharp after exercise, and um, you know. It looks like when you're in ketosis, when your beta hydroxybutyrate is high, BDNF production is increased. Done. That's all we need to know. Well, here we go. So, going low carb, going in and out of, going into ketosis occasionally, or if there is mild cognitive impairment or dementia, uh, uh, more extensively or more um, more consistently, seems to have a significant improvement in BDNF, which probably would help for. Uh, cognitive enhancement long term. Love to see that. Of course, they talk about omega 3s here. We use omega 3s in that situation as well, specifically DHA, uh, which they comment on. So it looks like it upregulates BDNF going into ketosis or having high uh, ketone bodies. Um, love to see that. Now, here's the kicker be careful with exogenous ketones or taking a ketone supplement. I don't know the effects on brain function of taking these things um, exogenously, and I know that if you're not already in ketosis, it could make you gain weight. Something to watch out for. I had I read a recent review about this, um, where it could uh, create a, a weight gain situation. So watch over. Just too much fuel on board. Next up, we're looking at. Okay, so we looked at brain uh, brain performance or cognitive performance. What about physical performance? Well, this was a study that was a randomized controlled trial to look at eight weeks of resistance training with and without time-restricted feeding. So what are they? One group was only allowed to eat within a four-hour period for four days a week, but had no uh, limitations on the quality, on the quantity uh, of foods or types of foods consumed. And then the other group, uh, they could eat whatever they want. They could basically eat the way that they were consuming prior. And um, what happened here was that you know they did some they did some resistance training multiple times per week and they uh, followed a specific protocol and they were trying to see if there was any effect on performance for this uh, time restricted feeding uh, way of living and here's what they saw Effect size data indicated gain in lean soft tissue in the group that performed resistance training without the time restricted feeding. Uh, upper and lower body strength and lower body muscular endurance increased in both groups, but effect sizes demonstrate greater improvements in the TRF or the time restricted feeding group. So there was greater improvements in upper and lower body strength and lower body muscular endurance in the time restricted feeding group. Overall, the TRF reduced energy intake and it reduced energy intake, so they, they ended up eating less calories, and they did not it did not adversely affect their lean mass retention or muscular improvements. Uh, with short-term resistance training in young males. So basically they got a bit stronger overall and they ate a few less calories and um, it looked like it. everything turned out pretty well. So I, I like to see that. That's another one that says, okay, because people are worried, like, is this going to affect me negatively? What about my strength? Am I going to be weak? And I'll be honest, when you're eating low calorie, sometimes if you're not mindful, you can feel weaker. And that can happen... Um, that can happen if you're eating the wrong types of food or if you're eating at the wrong time of day for your 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 uh, caloric need. For example, I need to eat in the morning if I'm going to be um, a, a sustainable, uh, if I'm going to stay sustainable energy throughout the course of the day, I need to eat in the morning. So that's just very specific to me. This was looking at strength um, objectively. They actually had imp increased uh, uh greater improvements in their upper and lower body strength and lower body muscular endurance over this uh, period of time. So exciting. The next one here, 
let's step into some some disease processes so this was a fasting mimicking diet this is I believe this was a Walter Longo diet so if you're familiar with the longevity diet I love that book so much you got to read it if you haven't already it's incredible um, I think he's he's a he's a genius um, his name is Walter Longo you can see he's the last name on the paper there I believe that's him um, and uh, this came out of a, real, a, a really reputable uh, popular journal a diet mimicking fasting uh, promotes regeneration and reduces autoimmunity and multiple sclerosis symptoms. Let's read through here. So what did they find? First of all, nothing much works for um, keeping people in a, a latent stage of MS. Uh, you know, we have these naturopathic protocols. It's really a case-by-case -case basis. We like the holistic approach to MS. Sometimes we have success, sometimes we don't. Um, when we have people with a relapsing remitting type of MS, we try and keep them um, as stable as possible for as long as possible. You know, often diet therapy is very helpful. This is a new wave, fasting mimicking diet. So let's read what happened here. They did periodic three-day cycles of fasting mimicking diet. If you're not familiar with what that is, you can read his book, but it's usually um, green vegetables covered in olive oil twice a day. It's more scientific than that. You have to read his book to figure out the details. Uh, they these cycles were effective in ameliorating demyelination and symptoms in a murine experimental autoimmune encephalitis uh, encephalomyelitis model. This is how they replicate um, MS in an animal model. They use this technique, and they were able to show that my goodness, if they do this fasting mimicking diet they've developed, which is like really really low carb, um, uh, half fat, half carb from veggies. Uh, for this three-day period, they uh, there was less demyelination. So if you're familiar with MS, the nerves uh, lose their myelin, so their firing is uh, capacity is is altered. So basically, this diet reduced the clinical severity in these mice, and it completely reversed the symptoms in 20% of them, which is awesome, so awesome to see. Considering it's a diet therapy, it's wicked safe, and. Um, we're just looking for things that are effective. And when things like this are effective, it's like, oh shoot, okay, we need to be implementing this. These improvements were associated with increased corticosterone, corticosterone levels and Treg cell numbers and reduced levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, TH1, TH17, and, and APCs, antigen-presenting cells. So inflammation was down, let's be honest. Moreover, FMD promoted oligodendrocyte precursor cell regen, regeneration, and remyelination axons in a few different models. So they actually had some healing. Um, and that's kind of what we're looking for here. Like, how can we reduce symptoms, but also at the same time try to promote healing? It worked in these mice, it worked. So in autoimmune diseases, should we be considering this type of diet therapy, which is fasting mimicking diet, or very, very low calorie diet periodically? I think probably yes. Um, and mainly because it's sometimes effective definitely an anti-inflammatory and mostly safe if your naturopathic doctor or medical doctor knows what the heck they're doing. Exciting. Okay, let's talk about uh, metabolic disease. So this study was, look, this is British Journal of Nutrition, intermittent versus continuous energy restriction, the differential effects on postprandial after meal glucose and uh, lipid metabolism following matched weight loss in overweight obese participants. So this study was really cool because they're looking at, okay, what if these two groups of people lose the same amount of weight? How are their metabolic markers going to be different when we compare uh, a simple intermittent energy restriction? So that's uh, like we talked about before, taking a couple days and eating less versus just eating less all week. If you're not getting the vibe here, I think eating less once in a while is better than just eating less all week. Um, and these studies are really why I feel that way. So let's review what happened in this one. Okay, so uh, this one, what were they doing here? Uh, they wanted to compare the effects they had 27 overweight obese participants who were randomized to either either group so two days a week at this number of calories or kilojoules which is a different type of calories i believe that's about 600 um, versus uh, a, a continuous energy restriction um, i believe this was the 90 percent of regular diet for uh, need to maintain ma uh, mass I think if I look through, anyways, they had a calorie restriction. 
Okay, so actually, you know, the intermittent energy restriction was a greater, a substantial, so greater than 70% energy restriction for a couple days versus a continued and continuous energy restriction, which I believe was about 90% of their regular diet for the whole week. Okay, so what did they find here? The study found no statistically significant difference in time to attain 5% weight loss. So they both lost it in about the same amount of time. But if you look at the median here, 59 days for the one group and 73 days for the other group, but that wasn't statistically significant because there wasn't very many people, but one group definitely was faster. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, so then they looked at postprandial measures or after meals. Neither diet significantly altered glycemia, so blood sugar control, but insulinemia was reduced comparatively. So the reduction, uh, so insulin sensitivity improved in the intermittent energy restriction group again. So another case here where we're having better insulin control with having these couple days of energy restriction or calorie restriction. Next up, the reduction C peptide tended to be greater following intermittent energy restriction. Okay, yeah, right, 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 right. The relative reduction in triglyceride responses was greater following intermittent energy restriction. So this group who only ate a lower calorie two days a week had better triglyceride responses. Amazing. In conclusion here, the preliminary findings highlight underlying differences between these two groups and just show that for a cholesterol or triglyceride restriction or reduction it looks like intermittent energy restriction or this 5-2 diet uh, is better it's also better for insulin sensitivity love seeing that again uh, next up on the group group let's talk about cancer therapy so uh, cancer therapy is dramatically improving in modern medicine it's getting better and better and better and there the the specialists that we have the oncologists we have are really doing an amazing job of simply turning cancer into a chronic disease we're not seeing like you know tons and tons of cures but we're seeing people live a normal lifespan and uh, basically a normal health span with a diagnosis of cancer so basically they're able to do and be everything they want to do and be for a lifespan that would be considered normal thanks to the great work that the researchers and the oncologists are able to do Let's talk about how calorie restriction and uh, and intermittent fasting can play a play a role in contributing to this awesome trend, which is that people are doing so much better in cancer therapy. This one is another one from Walter Longo, Longevity Diet. I believe if you look through that book, you might see this one referenced. Um, Short-term starvation or fasting protects normal cells, uh, mice, and potentially humans from harmful side effects of chemo drugs. Chemo drugs are toxic. Let's face it. That's the the mechanism behind them is that they're toxic. Um, if you look through Walter Longo's book, you'll see that in a few different models, fasting protocols allow chemo to be more potent against the cancer cells while allowing the healthy cells to be resistant to the damage from the chemo. This is a review of some of the studies they've done that show this. Now, this needs to be done in a clinical setting. I'm, I'm able to do this with my um, uh, integrative cancer patients uh, who are working with the British Columbia Cancer Authority here. They're able to just do low calorie diets before they do their chemo and it helps it work better. But if you're going to do it on your own, please get your medical team involved. Fasting before chemotherapy helps your healthy cells stay stronger and makes the chemo more toxic to the cancer. Uh, I believe that could be considered a fact now because of all the work these guys have done, the names on this list. Okay, next up, fasting, circadian rhythm, and time-restricted feeding and healthy lifespan. Let's talk about longevity. So we've talked about autoimmune disease, cancer therapy, we've talked about weight loss, we've talked about cognitive, imp uh, cognitive improvements, mood improvements, anxiety reduction. What about living longer? So this is a review done by both Sachin Panda and Walter Longo. Sachin Panda is a time-restricted feeding guy. If you look through his podcasts, you'll see that he's got some awesome things to say and he's done some incredible work in this area in terms of the studies they've done. And then um, the other author here, Walter Longo, I mentioned a few times. Most animals alternate periods of feeding with periods of fasting coinciding with sleep. Upon greater than 24 hours of fasting, humans, rodents, and other mammals enter alternative metabolic phases, which rely less on sugar and more on ketone body-like carbon sources. Okay, period. We all go through these periods where we don't eat because we need to sleep. The question is, how long should that period be 
to promote optimal longevity. And this has been a subject of great debate in the last uh, many years. This one was published in 2016 in journal Cell Metabolism, one of the best journals there is. Um, but this conversation has been going on for a very long time. I tuned in about 2014, um, but I have seen some awesome reviews from 2010, 2012. So in their write-up, these are probably the two leading um, authorities in uh, longevity and both time-restricted feeding and, and intermittent fasting. And they're saying throughout this that it's probably going to help with longevity. The mice who don't, who do calorie restrict and live long, restriction and live longer. The mice who do intermittent, uh, sorry, time-restricted feeding, with uh, greater than 13 hours, I believe, I see the 12 hour mark here, greater than 13 hours, I believe they live longer. Um, let's, let's go through a little bit of what they say here. Understanding the mechanistic link between, nu uh, between nutrients and the, f and the fasting benefits is leading to the identification of fasting mimicking diets that achieve changes similar to those caused by fasting. Given the pleiotrophic and sustained benefits of both types of these diets, both basic science and translational research are warned to develop fasting associated interventions into feasible, uh, effective, and inexpensive uh, treatments with the potential to improve health span. So the point here is that both of these researchers are finding benefit with the, in their animal studies for longevity, and we need to start doing human trials here. We need to look through and uh, get some longevity trials going because it seems like this way of living whether it be doing a fasting mimicking diet once in a while, where you do very low calorie for three to five days, or doing time restricted feeding where you don't eat for 13, 14 hours every night, uh, is probably good for promoting longevity. Uh, if you wanna go in depth in this one, Google it and try and read through it because these guys are geniuses. Now finally, uh, one final review here about uh, longevity. This one, another one by Sachin Panda and another author here, uh, again, reviewing, I don't know what journal this is, but I thought it was important just to add in, and I'd like to read the abstract for you, and um, just to, to just solidify this point. Circadian rhythms optimize physiology and health by temporarily coordinating cellular function, tissue function, and behavior. So what they're saying here, there's a lot that needs to happen when we sleep. There should not be a ton of nutrients on board. We should, we should obviously not be eating while we're sleeping. We should be recovering. And if we eat a ton of food right before bed, it might hinder that recovery process. It might negatively impact our sleep cycle, therefore making, causing, uh, giving us an inability to transition through the proper phases of sleep and therefore have proper hormone release and, um, and recovery. These endogenous rhythms dampen with age and thus compromise temporal uh, coordination. Feeding fasting patterns are an external cue that profoundly influence the robustness of daily biological rhythms. We have a rhythm and we should honor it. Erratic eating patterns can disrupt the temporal coordination of metabolism and physiology leading to chronic disease that are diseases that are also characteristic of aging. So disrupting our circadian rhythm probably leads to disease. However, sustaining a robust feeding fasting cycle, even with altering nutrition quality or quantity can prevent or reverse these chronic diseases in experimental models. So if we get back on track, if we honor the natural cycles of our body, we can reduce the potential for chronic disease and we can be healthier longer. In humans, epidemiological studies have shown erratic eating patterns increase the risk of disease, whereas sustained feeding fasting cycles or prolonged over overnight fasting is correlated with protection from uh, many diseases. Here they're mentioning breast cancer. Therefore, optimizing the timing of external cues with defined eating patterns can sustain a robust circadian clock, which may prevent disease and improve prognosis. I wanted to end on this because I think it's really powerful coming from people I, I, um, I respect um, beyond and it, it's just nice to see in print naturopaths have been honoring the circadian rhythm for uh, over a hundred years we've been talking about prolonged fasting we used to have hospitals set up a hundred years ago where all they did was water fasting medically supervised and we've reached a point in our in our our time here on earth where access to food is is over the top 
it's far too easy to get calories at any moment and we have to rely on our own discipline to avoid these calories and to we have to rely on our own knowledge of circadian rhythm to actually implement it because it's very simple to have that bowl of ice cream before bed because we're craving sugar it's very simple to uh, to have a to have very very high calorie dinners it's very simple to eat breakfast immediately upon waking because we have to get to work in 10 minutes it's very simple to fall into the trap of 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 uh, deregulating our circadian rhythm and the note here is that that leads to chronic disease which reduces longevity and causes suffering and if you're familiar with the suffering if you've sat with someone passing away from a chronic disease um, as I have multiple times if you've seen someone go through the 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 torture of autoimmune disease the torture of cancer if you've seen someone have cardiovascular events that have uh, have made their life miserable and debilitating that have significantly uh, destroyed their quality of life long term you know that honoring the circadian rhythm is something to be passionate about and to implement low calorie diets when needed when possible to implement time restricted feeding or to not eat at night to have significant periods of time without food while you should be sleeping to practice intermittent fasting once in a while to do these type of activities to promote long-term wellness you'll you'll know you know the importance so i really want to to end with that today because i'm extremely passionate about this i think it's the it's very it's, it's a very much an appropriate part of a holistic approach to optimal wellness and longevity Today in the review, we've covered weight loss, we've covered depression reduction, anxiety reduction, we've co co covered cognitive improvements, we've covered autoimmune disease reduction, uh, improvements in cancer care, uh, we've covered everything, we've covered everything. Diet therapy and nutrition therapy is very, very important. An important part of that therapy should be some type of calorie restriction, time-restricted feeding, or intermittent fasting if necessary. I want to thank you so much for tuning in and, and sitting through my little, uh, my little talk here. And I hope that if you're interested in inter integrative medicine and chronic disease management, you'll tune in again. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.